So this is molar mass determination by the depression of freezing point lab from the general chemistry lab manual. So this is a lab where you're going to look at the effects of putting solutes into solution and what their effect is on a melting temp of the water. And so uh, ultimately it's a temperature lab and a solutions lab. So you're going to have this ice water mixture in an insulated Dewar flask thermos. Um, you're going to put some ice in there. You're going to let it reach equilibrium, which assume will be very close to the freezing point of ice. You'll then repeat the experiment with the, a solute added, either a liquid or a, uh, a salt that's been dissolved in solution. Um, and you're going to see how that affects the uh, melting temp when it establishes, uh, re-establishes equilibrium. Now to do this, what you're going to do, have to do is a lot of masses. So you're going to first measure the mass of the solution. You're going to be able to filter the ice off, determine the mass of the solution, and the mass, you'll know the mass of the solutes, and that'll allow you to get the molality of the solution once you know the temperature depression. And then you're going to repeat this. It's all well spelled out in the lab notebook. You're going to repeat this uh, two times for each liquid. You're going to do two trials with the liquid and two trials with the salt. So you'll be able to use the temperature, the change in temperature of the melting temp to then calculate the molality and then you'll have all these masses which will allow you then to determine the, the molecular weight of the solute. So for the liquid, you're going to be able to determine the molar mass and you will compare that then to the known. You'll actually know what this liquid is and you'll know its molecular weight. For the salt, you're also going to know what the, the solid is, but you're going to calculate the uh, dissociation I that we'll talk about here in a few moments. Fundamentally, this lab is a, a objective is about manipulating solutions, but it has a lot of quantitative components to it, and it requires care in accumulating the data. Okay, so you may not have had this in class yet, but uh, there's this idea that if you dissolve a solute in solution, uh, it will cause an elevation of the boiling pressure and a depression of the freezing point. Okay, so what we're going to have is not technically a freezing the liquid solid, but we have a, an equilibrium where we have water and liquid ice, uh, ice solid and, and, and water in equilibrium. When we have it, it, it at that time, it'll have a certain temperature that will be roughly equal to its melting temp. Okay? Now what happens is when we add the solute, what you end up doing, why it has this effect on boiling point and melting point is because it lowers its vapor pressure. Okay, of the solution. And so as a result, the ice will have to cool off for its vapor pressure to get low enough to match water. And so as a result, then you get this uh, lowering of temperature that can be quantitated and relates to the amount of solute particles that are actually in solution. And this freezing point depression then is dictated by the formula here. So the change in temperature, and it could be in Celsius or Kelvin or whatever, um, is equal to this cryoscopic constant, so Kf, which in the case of water is 1.86 uh, degrees Celsius per molality, okay? Then there's this concept of molality. Now, if you haven't had this, molality is a little bit different than molarity. It's indicated by a small m, and it is equal to the moles of solute divided by the kilograms of solvent. So this is different than solutions. So solutions are solute over volume of solution. This is mole solute divided by the kilograms of the solvent. Okay, so this is a little bit different. And then finally, there's this factor I, which basically questions how many particles your solute dissociates to. If it's just a liquid that's non-ionic, that is one, and so you can just ignore it. But for things like salts, like sodium chloride, magnesium chloride, it's the number of ions that it's going to dissociate into. And so ideally, um, there's a, it'll be two for something like NaCl, but we're actually going to measure and show that maybe it's not entirely uh, the case. Okay, so in terms of what we're changing from the lab manual, the lab manual goes with pure unknowns, and I don't think that is uh, too useful. I think instead what we'll do is we'll actually know the compound, we'll still determine it experimentally and compare it to the known value to see how well uh, it comes to accurately representing it. And for uh, various reasons, this equation has some limitations, and so we just have to see if, um, you know, uh, if these limitations are enough to give us inaccurate data. Mainly it's the fact that these use ideal solutions, and ideal solutions really are pretty dilute solutions. And we have trouble then with the sensitivity of our instruments in that if we made a very dilute solution, we would not see a very big temperature change and our, we would not be able to measure it with our current equipment. So we have to play this game. And so what's going to be important um, in uh, this lab then is being able to understand where your uncertainties come and then being able to propagate that into your answer. So um, we believe that our thermometers are accurate plus or minus 0.1 degrees and our mass of our balance is about 0.01 degrees. And so what we'll do then is use this tolerance 
and the min-max method. Now, some of you had physics and have had a lot of air propagation. Some of you haven't. This is how we do it in chemistry. Let's just use min-max for this uh, approach, although you could use least squares or partial derivatives or any of that sort of thing. Now, remember, when we're talking about uncertainty, we're not talking about uncertainty of your ability to measure something out. It's just if you did it perfectly, what that uh, machine or equipment has. And so typically, we uh, it's one significant figure of, of error, and it's usually reported as plus minus. Now, there are certain things we don't have any uncertainty about. Conversion factors are one of them. Uh, and, and all constants basically are exact. Um, the same with uh, formulas. So we know that it's not two hydrogens plus or minus 0.1 hydrogen per oxygen. We know it's exactly two. So those are things that will always, you don't have to propagate error in those numbers because those are exact. But one place where you will have error, and, and it's a little bit difficult to propagate, is the question of uh, masses. Okay, so you're going to measure things on balances a lot today. And if you think about how this works, and your instructor might need to sort of help you along with this, um, really there's, if you look at the error and you apply the propagation, um, you end up getting sort of different tolerances depending on how you weigh it. Okay, so there's one where we call relative difference. And this would be the example where you go to a balance with a beaker, uh, you tear the balance first, you put the beaker on, you get the mass, then you fill it with liquid while you're still there, and you measure it, and you get that mass. Now, if you do that, that's what we call sort of a one trip, and you're measuring by relative difference. So you can imagine that the each time you do a measurement, it's going to be plus or minus 0 0.001. So in this case, you put the tear when you zero it, it's zero plus or minus 0 0.01. And let's say our beaker is 100 milligram, 100 grams. That's also going to be 0 0.001. And so then that total difference then in our uncertainty will be 0.002. Okay, and if we measure the, so let's say we put the beaker on there, we zero it again, and we weigh it again, well, it's still 0.002. Now, the key difference is if we walk away from the balance, okay, and we have to come back, re-zero it, uh, and then weigh it, then we're doing absolute differences. And so this is essentially the two trips. This is where you've gone away, come back to, you, to the balance later, and reset it, because then what you're saying is each time, okay, you're measuring a 0.002 difference, okay? So it's sort of like taking the things from the one trip relative difference now and using, if you subtract those, then according to the min-max method where you maximize the differences, uh, that mass of the sample has an error now of 0.004. Again, this is something you can work with your instructor uh, if you don't understand. Um, there's also a handout uh, that will be available for download that you can look at that will help uh, explain some of these things. The mass is usually the trickiest of the bunch. Uh, in terms of safety, you know, we are dealing with some alcohols and things that are flammable, but we shouldn't have any flames around. Uh, so the most realistic problem is that we break a doer. Doer, These doers are thermoses, and if you've ever broken a thermos, uh, they shatter like crazy. They're vacuum packed. They make a lot of glass go everywhere. And in this case, these doers are also pretty expensive. So um, if you're mixing these things, you've got to be careful that you don't break them, don't tip them. Um, you know, be very thoughtful when it comes to, and, and purposeful when it comes to when you mix these things, I think, because uh, that would be by far, we don't have that many doers either, so losing one would be a significant blow for us. So please be careful with the doers. Okay, so the protocol is just as described in the lab manual. You'll take some DI water. It doesn't really matter how much. Probably, you know, 75 mils or so. You will, uh, I went ahead and measured it. Um, you don't have to. Um, if you want to, that's fine. An approximate volume will be sufficient because we're really interested in masses here, not necessarily volumes. Okay, so we're, but we're going to get a, basically make a ice water mixture. So you'll chuck in some ice. Um, You'll kind of swirl it and wait until it comes to sort of a final resting point. Again, be very careful when you mix that you don't actually knock over the doers. Um, you may need to add more ice. This could take a while. So we've got plenty of time to do this lab, so just be patient. Okay, but then once it eventually it will come to an equilibrium, and then at this point you can measure the temperature and, and get, get an idea about what the temperature is going to be. Okay, so this will be, hopefully, this will match the freezing point of water. Now, these thermometers are not calibrated, so it may not be perfect, but you never know. Okay. So now the other thing here is then you'll measure out a certain mass of solute. So it may be uh, you'll have two alcohols to choose from. Uh, pick one of them uh, and do that, uh, and we can make sure you get the mass of it, not just the volume. You don't even really need the volume. You really just need mass. But it should be about 10 mils. 
10 mils is usually enough to kind of get you in the ballpark. And so then once you measure that, you can, now that you've got this equilibrated system, you can go back, uh, dump that into the, um, into the doer. Um, you probably need to chuck in a little bit more ice because um, the ice is going to melt. So you need to chuck in some more um, and, and then repeat basically the swirl and the, the rest of it. Okay, now while you're doing that, you can go over to and get a larger beaker, something that'll hold your whole solution and get the mass of that, um, write that down, okay? Because then you're gonna come back and then once you've reached your equilibrium, you know that the temperature isn't going down anymore. Okay, it's not gonna warm up, so you'll be fine. Then just use the screen here like I am to basically do it like a martini shaker where you pour off the ice. Now, the key is to try to get it all transferred. I think that's gonna be the place where there might be a little difficulty, you know, especially if it kind of sticks to the edge. So this may be a two person operation. I did it as one. And then you've now filtered off the ice, you can go and measure the mass of the solution. Now the key here is not to have too much liquid in there or else you have to break it up into pieces because again, the balance only has a certain size limit. All right, so at that point then, um, I went ahead and used a graduated cylinder, you don't need to, but I added a little bit more water, okay? And so I added, you know, maybe 50 mils, 20 mils. You want to make sure it's not too big for the doer. Um, you also would ideally like it to be low enough that you can still put it on the balance, okay? And so you'll have, then you'll need to chuck in some more ice and, and do the equilibration again, okay? So this time I added, uh, I don't know, I think probably about another 75 mils of water or something like that. So if you think about what you're doing, you're diluting the solution so the molality is going to go down. And so the temperature depression should not be as much as it was the first time. Okay, so you're going to allow it to be equilibrated again. And you'll just repeat the same experiment with filtering it and measuring the mass. And so you'll have two molalities for each substance, one for the liquid, one for the solid. You'll have two for the liquid and two for the solid. And then you can compare those two and see if they are in agreement. So at this point, you'll want to rinse out, clean out your doer real well, uh, dry it out with some paper towels as well. You just want to get rid of all the solute that's in there because you need to do the second stage. Now for the second one, you've got a solid. Um, and what I would suggest doing is pre-dissolving that solid in some water, getting it totally dissolved before you add it to the doer. The doer is not really designed to dissolve compounds very well. Um, so we can probably get some stir bars and the stir plate and you can actually mix your salt mix your salt and your water together until it actually becomes um, clear. Then add that to the doer. Okay so once you do that it's exactly the same experiment. You just now have this other solvent. So you're gonna chuck it in there, add some ice, let it reach equilibrium, and then measure the temperature, measure the mass of solution and then do it again with a little bit more water in there to dilute it down. And so you do that, you'll do that twice. So you should have, in, at the end of each one, you should have two meetings. Everything can go down the sink today. Um, and so it should be a piece of cake. Okay, so you're gonna work in pairs, each group. So you'll basically have four temperature measurements you're gonna have to make. So each group can do two. You'll have one for a solid and one for a liquid. The key thing is don't, you know, make sure that it's gotten as cold as it can get, okay? A lot of people, I think, are going to try to take a temperature that's not as depressed as it should be because they just become impatient, okay? And the other thing is make sure that all your salt is dissolved because if it's not dissolved, it's not going to depress the boiling, the melting temp at all. So if you do those, you should be fine. Again, if you have a 400 mil beaker, you probably don't want to go more than 150 mils on the, uh, on the solution uh, total at the end because it'll max out your balance. If you do, you can still fix it. You just have to measure it in two pieces rather than one, which makes it a little bit uh, complicated. So at the end, you'll have sort of, you'll have two, um, you should have for each the solid and the liquid, a mass of each one, a mass of the solid, mass of the liquid. You'll have the temperature depression on two different runs. And then you'll have the um, mass of the solution on two different runs, okay? So if you do that, that gives you all the stuff as sort of described in the lab manual to allow you to calculate molar mass.